Okay, we are going to move into our study of First John. As we continue, a couple of weeks ago, we gave an introduction, and then we noticed last week the first four verses of First John chapter 1. We call that an introduction. Some people call it a prologue. And we saw in the first four verses of First John what the apostles' aim was, keeping in mind, as we've said over and over again, it's written to Christians. He is intending to declare and does the word of life, the eternal life that was with the Father and has been manifested in Jesus Christ, 1 John 1, 1 and 2. He says, this he's doing that we might have fellowship with the Father and Son just as the apostles have fellowship with them, 1 John 1 and verse 3. And then as we've emphasized again, he says, I'm writing this so your joy may be full, 1 John 1 and verse 4. I might uh, mention that if we go about doing what's right, then our joy will be full because our determination is what's right will be as the Lord defines the right, and that's done in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. So to have the fullness of joy, then we must experience the kind of life that comes from having fellowship with God. And the question is, what is the basis of our fellowship with God? Because we want to know that, because it's the basis of the life that produces the fullness of joy. Now, the part of 1 John we're looking at now is 1 John chapter 1, but we're looking, beginning in verse 5, actually. And this, the thoughts there will carry us on through chapter 2 and verse 2. 1 John 1, 5 through chapter 2 and verse 2. Because in, in these verses, John is discussing the very basis of fellowship with God. He also describes the place of sin and how it can affect that fellowship. So one of the things that would be right that we would want to do is the Bible defines the right is to understand how as a sinner, one comes into fellowship with God. Now, Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. So all men who are accountable to God for their actions, sin and are separated from God. But these people have already heard the gospel. They are Christians. They're members of the Lord's church. They're living the Christian life. Yet they need these enriching principles to strengthen them so they can remain faithful, that they won't fall away. So in verse 5, we notice really the, the very premise for having fellowship with God. There it is. God is light. God is light. Now, we've touched on these things, and we've looked at them at other times, and it's nothing new. If you read through the Gospel of John, you'll see that kind of thing talked about. And the figure of light is often used in Scripture to describe uh, what's good, what is right, what is righteous, what is true. Paul does that in Ephesians 5, 8 through 10. Therefore, God must always be thought of in this way. He is good. He is righteous. He is right. He is the source of all of that which is right. He is true. And notice he says, in him is no darkness at all. Now, the figure of darkness always represents evil, lies, falsehood, unrighteousness. So we can never think of God 
as countenancing sin or excusing it in any way. I've said this many times at different times under different studies, but one of the things <clears throat> the rightly divided word as we come to understand it, 2 Timothy 2.15 through our study does for us, it helps us face reality. <clears throat> Let me remind you again that a great many people have a lot of problems mentally and emotionally because they simply cannot face facts. Facts are real. They can't therefore face reality. And we end up believing lies because many times we don't want to face what is real. But remember, when we define truth, it's objective and absolute. It doesn't make a difference whether you're male or female, old or young, rich or poor, or anything like that. Truth is just what a thing is. It corresponds with what? Reality. So what does that tell us about why some people reject the truth? It makes you see things as they genuinely are. It exposes darkness or lies or error. Satan is going to operate right the, operate, uh, the opposite. He's going to try to get you to trust yourself. Therefore, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So one of the things that a person must do is keep an honest and good heart, Luke 8, verse 15, that we can truly see ourselves in the light of God's truth. Because he is truth, he is right, he is good, and he does not countenance sin. We must not countenance sin. Whenever we see sin in our lives, we should abhor it. We should rebuke ourselves. We should repent of it. We should ask God for forgiveness. Now, when we were baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins, because we have been brought to believe in Christ, to repent of our sins, we have died to the practice of sin at repentance, Acts 1730. And we were made alive a new creature in Christ when we rose from water to the grave of baptism because we were born of water in the Spirit. John 3, verse 3 and verse 5. We were baptized into Christ, John, or rather Galatians 3, 27. Our sins were remitted, Acts 2, verse 38. Our sins were washed away, Acts 22, 16. Now we stand before God, added to the church by the Lord, Acts 2, verse 47, redeemed. In the realm where God has located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, Ephesians 1, verse 3. What does that mean? Well, it means I'm a new creature. Well, what does that mean? My whole outlook on life's changed. First of all, it's changed inwardly concerning myself. It's changed completely about what I'm to do while I'm here. And it emphasizes greatly changing to think about where you're going when you leave here because everybody will Hebrews 9:27 it's appointed unto men once to die and after that the judgment when people say well we're all headed for the same place trying to justify denominationalism I can agree with them that we're all headed to the same place but it's not what they mean we're all headed for judgment every single solitary accountable person is headed to the judgment bar of God to give an account of the deeds done in the body whether good or bad now really life is not worth living if you don't prepare yourself for the judgment because everybody's going to die and we only have one life to live thus we ought to be rejecting darkness we ought to be facing reality and to do that we must love the truth john it was john who recorded jesus saying if you continue in my word then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So if we're honest of heart, we take the message, and we see things for what they really are, 
And sin is not countenanced by God. So when people begin to blame God for things, why did God do that to me? Why did God allow that to happen to me? Then they have a wrong view of God. Because God is good, God is right, God is truth. Now these people he's writing to, you mean they don't know that? Well, of course they do, they're Christians. But they need to be reminded. We all need to be reminded. John's doing some of that here. So with this basic understanding clearly established of what God is, John now addresses some false claims concerning fellowship with God. And he does that starting in verse 6 all the way through verse 10. Notice, if we say we have fellowship with him, but we walk in darkness... Well, there's something wrong. And really, he's already laid out why it would be wrong, hasn't he? Because God's good, God is light, God is true. And the truth of God's good word helps us to face the facts. For the person outside of Christ, it helps them or her to see that they're separated from God by their sins. You know, a person doesn't have to be a terribly immoral person to be lost. I think some people think that they're all right if they're not immoral. But what we must realize is that there are sins of morality, but then there are religious sins. And we need to understand that a person can be a person who speaks the truth, a person you can trust, a person who loves his family, a person who works hard to take care of his family, tries to be a good husband or wife, but is lost because all of sin comes short of the glory of God. And if they straighten their moral life up, that doesn't necessarily mean they have corrected their religious or spiritual life, if you want to look at it in that standpoint. Because the Bible teaches, specifically the New Testament of the Christ, the truth, the reality of what one must know, believe, and do to become a Christian. And yet most of those who claim Christ as Savior don't believe the truth of God regarding becoming a Christian. They have all sorts of doctrines that they think the Bible teaches that it does not. Falsehood, darkness. And they have to be honest enough with themselves to evaluate what they have been taught or led to believe what God requires of a person to become a Christian and what they've actually, and what the Bible actually teaches. As Christians, we have that responsibility to ourselves to teach the truth, even as John's doing right here, to increase our fellowship and strengthen it. But we also have to understand in teaching the gospel to the people outside of Christ, they have to be brought to an understanding that they are separated from God. And they must see then the truth, the reality. They may be very good moral people, but they're wrong religiously. That's got to be changed because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and they need to be forgiven of those sins. Well, I have to know what the Bible teaches in our day and age of what one must do, believe and do to be saved from sin. We know now that John's laid out clearly that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So false claims concerning fellowship can't be from God. So when people say we have fellowship with him, but we walk in darkness, uh, why, is, why is this claim false? I think we've already begun to touch on that. Because fellowship, koinonia is the Greek word, basically means that we have something in common. A person outside of Christ doesn't have anything in common with Christ. Because koinonia means a sharing. Something's imparted. 
both ways. God has what we need when it comes to salvation. God is good. God is true. The truth of God, God's revealed word, the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11, the sword of the spirit, Ephesians 6, 17, in an honest and good heart, Luke 8, 15, causes a person to see himself as God sees him. Now, it is not a very pleasant thing sometimes to see yourself as God sees you. James wrote to Christians too, you remember, James 1, 25, whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man will be blessed in his deed. Now, God's New Testament and the truth taught is the mirror into which we look to see ourselves as God sees us. And that ties right back in to God being light. There's a spotlight shines on us anytime we honestly study the Bible and begin to see ourselves as God sees us. So, as we've seen that God is light, goodness, righteousness, truth, walking in darkness, therefore, would be going against everything God stands for. You might jot this uh, text down to go along with this, where Paul writes in Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 24. Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 24. So, John is trying to say, you can't say that you're a godly person if you don't do godly things. If you don't follow the right as it's revealed in the word of Christ. If we are false, in other words, in our deeds, then we're not practicing the truth. All of us need to be reminded of that. It's very easy to, I guess you'd say, fall down on the job of uh, being introspective and with an honest and good heart in the light of the rightly divided word of God. Instead, we, we then, uh, instead of uh, being blinded or deceived or seeing ourselves like uh, we say we want to see ourselves, but remember, the person can deceive themselves. And that's how Satan gets us. We have to walk in the light as he's in the light. So instead of living a life characterized by evil deeds, unrighteous acts, believing and following error, all the while claiming to be in fellowship with God, we should and we must live a life in harmony with God's goodness, righteousness, and truth. It seems to me that one of the things that stands out greatly about the denominational concept of salvation by grace only. The devil sold a whole host of people a false doctrine that says, well, you can't save yourself. Anything you do is an effort on your part to save yourself. So therefore, we're saved by grace only. We're saved by God's favor only. But, you know, God would have everybody be saved. Jesus died for everyone. So we know God's attitude, and if we're saved by God's grace only, then everybody would be saved. But the Bible doesn't teach that. I don't know what they do with such teachings as Christ being the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. But that's a perfect harmony for what John's talking about here, Hebrews 5 and verse 9. So we're concerned, even as Christians, about living a life that really says we are of Christ. Well, that's what the word Christian means. So we need to be asking the question, if I'm wearing the name Christian rightly and honestly, how am I living? Because only those people can experience fellowship one with another. You notice what we said all along is that, first of all, everybody must seek to be in fellowship with God, which involves being forgiven by God of your sins. Well, once that takes place, as we studied earlier in the class, then we're 
in a position we're qualified to be in fellowship with all others who are in fellowship with God. And we don't want to not be in fellowship with anybody that's in fellowship with God. So our concern, number one, is to be in fellowship with God so that we can be in fellowship with one another. And to be in fellowship with God and to remain in fellowship with God, we must walk in the light as Jesus is in the light, that we can have fellowship one with another. Now, that's the way to eternal life. That's how we can share in the glorified life of eternity that the Lord will give us on the day of judgment and the resurrection because we'll be resurrected in glorified bodies that he now possesses. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. Well, when he says good and faithful servant, what does he mean? He means the ones who have done right the ones that walk in the light because God is light. They want to be like God. How do I know how to be like God? Jesus came to show us. If you want to just sum up a few words, what Jesus came to do, he came to show us how God would live as a man. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John gives us the life of Christ on earth, living as a man. And thus we have his last will and testament that we put into practice concerning becoming a Christian, and in this case, living the Christian life. That's the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, that we contacted when we were baptized into his death as a penitent believer, Romans 6, 3 and 4, Colossians 2, 12, that cleansed us from our past sins. Let me remind you again that when a person is baptized into Christ, it's their past sins that are forgiven. And they come in contact, as John talks about here, with the blood of Christ, and that blood continues to wash away our sins, to cleanse us. For we're walking in the light. We're walking according to the truth of God. So it becomes very important to know whether we're walking in the light or walking in darkness. To walk in darkness is, well, it really implies total absence of good. But walking in the light suggests a life that's making progress under the positive influence of God's life. Light, the truth, the word that pertains to how to live a Christian life. We are, in other words, in a position of being in God's favor when we're baptized into Christ. We're in God's grace because we were baptized into Christ as penitent believers. Thus, we're in a position to grow and to develop. And that's what John is getting at when he says we walk in the light as he, Christ, is in the light. So we're growing, we're developing a life enjoying the cleansing power of Jesus' blood. And who is that? Well, it's the person that meets the conditions of forgiveness that we'll now look at as time allows. Notice in verses 8 and 9 that he talks about we have no sin. That's interesting. We have to understand what John's talking about. Now, John may have reference to statements made by professing Christians at that time in error because they're saying, well, we, we're sinless. We don't ever sin. That's not what John's saying. Because he refutes that. The consequences of someone saying, well, I don't sin, is to deceive ourselves. It's a self-deceit. He says, if we do that, the truth's not in us. So we're back walking in darkness rather than walking in the light. Well, then what keeps us in the blood of Christ? What well, we say faithful Christian living, what does that mean? Well, one of the chief things it means is that we're humble and willing and ready and always confessing our sins. First John 1, 9, first part of that verse 
And of course, I just say the whole New Testament written to Christians. That part of it that's written to them concerning godly living. To walk in the light is not to be in a state of where you don't need to continue to grow in knowledge, practice the truth. It doesn't mean you'll never need to repent of a sin or you'll never commit a sin. But there's a big difference in a person who habitually practices sin. Well, even that person might do a good thing once in a while. But the person who has obeyed the gospel, and I won't go back over it, we've already said that many times, baptized the Christ, past sins remitted, added to the church by the Lord, Acts 2, 47, walking in the light as the truth of God directs us, gives us that light, then that person is growing and developing. He's, uh, I guess you could put it this way, he's always headed upward. Will he commit sin from time to time? Yes. He's a human being. And the greatest sin he could commit was say, well, now I'm a Christian, I don't commit sin. That puts him back in darkness. But there's a big difference in the person who sets his mind on doing right, strives every day to learn the truth, review one's life, make sure they're living like it. If there's anything they see amiss, they're willing to repent of it. They constantly are being aware of, of the sins that could creep in. And it's not just a necessarily a confession of any one sin. It's, a, it's also a reality that stays with the person who walks in the light, who says, I'm willing always to acknowledge sins. That's the person that certainly will confess sins when they see the specific sin they've committed because they have the attitude of knowing how easy it is. And they know they're in a state of grace in the Lord's church, walking in the light, covered by the blood of the Lamb as they walk in the light, having fellowship with God and others who have done the same thing. There's a there's a humility that says, I can't get too big for my britches, so to speak, and say, well, I know, I've grown so much, I've never seen it anymore. So John heads that off rather quickly when he says, the person who says he doesn't sin has deceived himself. So the consequences of denying that we've sinned is that we make God a liar. And of course, that's just not the case. It also is the fact that his word's not in us. Because the more one knows of the truth of God concerning living as God would have us live, to strive to be like him in the flesh, to bring every thought and subjection to Christ, to keep every act subservient to the will of our master Christ is going to be seen in a caring for the word and the word will be in us. That's the person that hungers and thirsts after righteousness. Remember, John says a lot about being righteous in righteousness. So how can anyone who makes such claims as these hope to have fellowship with God and thereby enjoy the life such as this fellowship gives if they're Walking in darkness. Whatever that darkness is, it's a lie. It's contrary to God because God is light. And we walk in the light as Christ is in the light. The light of his word. So fellowship with God does not occur by making claims that really turns God into a liar. And that's what Jane, uh, John is saying. So though affirming that we do sin, John is not seeking to in encourage sin while well, the book's right the opposite isn't it isn't this book encouraging us not to sin he's writing so that we won't sin that's made very clear in the book but fellowship with god requires that a person takes sin very seriously to appreciate further how sin should be taken seriously. In fact, to see how God takes sin. Then we learn that fellowship with God requires an advocate. And that's what we run into in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. He's telling us that we have, and I'd like to talk about it this way, we have a, a heavenly attorney 
And he's somebody that's been here, been tempted at every point like as we are yet without sin, who loved us to the uttermost and went to the cross, suffered, bled, and died, raised from the dead, and went to heaven. And he ever lived to make intercession for us. He's the only mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. That's how we stay in full fellowship with God as we strive to grow and to develop in greater knowledge and practice of the truth, even when that involves having to confess sin. That's all part of it. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. I think it's interesting. He says, the righteous. Remember, he was tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. The word advocate then is uh, literally in the, in the original language is to call to one side to one's aid. It suggests the capability of giving aid. Now, who can do that? Jesus Christ, the righteous. I say again, it's used in a court of justice to denote a legal assessment or assistance, I should say, and an assessment of your situation that you need that type of thing. I guess you can say it's a counsel for the defense. Maybe it would help to go back and watch some old Perry Mason episodes and see just kind of how the counsel of the defense operates. But we have a perfect counsel of defense. The devil can throw all kinds of accusations. He can bring your past sinful life back upon you. It won't make any difference when one has obeyed the gospel, baptized into Christ, and walking in the lies he is in the light. The blood of Christ continually cleanses, and none of it sticks that the devil might throw against us. So again, I emphasize Jesus Christ, the righteous. It won't be uh, too long before we get to Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2 in our Sunday morning class. And uh, we'll see there that it's made very clear what is still true. As sinners, we're alienated from God. But Jesus is without sin. He is a, for lack of a better way to put it, a fit representative to come before God on our behalf. I just think of that. You have the Son of God at the right hand of God, the King over his kingdom, and you're a citizen of it. And he constantly mediates on our behalf and makes intercession for us. Now think of all the people in the world and you think of the Lord's church. And then in the Lord's church, think of the faithful in the Lord's church. And the very son of God is making intercession for us and mediating for us. The author of Hebrews also makes the point that though righteous, and this is the point I'm trying to make, he understands our situation perfectly. Hebrews 2, 17 through 18, and chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. So he himself, according to verse 2, is the propitiation for our sins. Now that word propitiation, we don't use much now. But it means an appeasing, an appeasing. The pagans would offer sacrifices to appease their gods. In the New Testament, it is, here's what's interesting. It is God, not man, who offers the appeasing sacrifice. 1 John chapter 4, and verse 10. So through our Lord's death on Calvary's cross, Jesus is the means by which God can show mercy and does show mercy to the sinner. Through the gospel of Christ, his power to save us from sin, Romans 1, 16. Now, this explains how God can be just, 1 John 1, 9, and still forgive sin. Jesus is appeased. Now, go back and read Isaiah 53. And that's exactly what he's talking about. The great appeasement made by 
the word that became flesh, the second person of the Godhead. So this wonderful propitiation was given to the whole world, made available to the whole world. But now notice this. It's accessed only by those who are faithful, obedient children. First John 2 and verse 2. And that's what Paul's talking about in Romans 3 in verses 21 through 26. Now, what have we seen? Well, in this first chapter, and even into the second, the inspired apostle John is making it very clear upon what basis we can have fellowship with God and enjoy the life that provides fullness of joy. That's one of the reasons he's writing the letter. We have fellowship with God. And we who are Christians, to do that, must not walk in darkness, must not believe a lie, must not engage in error, must not believe falsehood, must not defend it, but walk in the light of God's goodness as the word of God lets us know about it. It's being righteous. Righteous really is right doing. It's obeying the truth. It begins by admitting we've sinned and that from time to time, though we don't want to sin, we labor not to sin. We'd like to be in a position where we never would have to sin anymore. And that day's coming for those who stay walking in the light, see in the light. And it's called heaven. But what do we do while we're here? We utilize our advocate. Jesus Christ, the righteous. For he's the one that God has provided as the propitiation for our sins. First of all, we have to come to the conclusion by a right study of the word that we have sinned. And that has to do even as members of the church. Remember, most of the New Testament's written to members of the church on how to be Christians. In effect, how to walk in the light as he is in the light, how to stay in the fellowship, how to appeal to our advocate, Jesus Christ. So in 1 John 1, 9, John explained how those who are already children of God can appropriate the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. It's through confession and prayer. Well, you're not going to confess what you haven't uh, faced and that means you must face the reality in your life. You can't try to excuse sin. God doesn't. He made a remedy for it, but didn't excuse it. And we can't excuse it in our own lives nor in the lives of our brethren. And thus we confess our sins. And he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness through our prayers for forgiveness. And I'm speaking, of course, to those who are members of the church, Christians. As to the alien sinner, he must obey the gospel. She must obey the gospel. She must get into fellowship with God. There's only one doorway. We'll close as we this class tonight as we ended or as we began it, and that is there's a doorway into Christ where he's located all spiritual blessings. We've been studying about one of those where we have an advocate with the Father. A person outside of Christ doesn't have an advocate with the Father. He has one willing to save him, who's saying, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest in your soul. But that means that person must enter in through obedience to the, plan, to the gospel by complying with the steps in the plan of salvation. Believing in Christ, repenting of our sins, confessing our faith in Christ, and then being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Now, you keep that fellowship by walking in the light, for God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And you do that by facing the reality of growth and development and learning to despise sin, hate sin, and that begins first of all in our own lives. And thus, when we see sin, we confess our sins. 
But we don't live in an habitual life of sin. We live in a habitual life of faithful service to God. But we don't like sin. We hate sin. God hates sin. And thus we want to grow to be like God, Christ. But we'll terminate the study here tonight and continue with it next week. And we'll close with prayer, if you'd bow with me. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful that we could be together in the searching of the scriptures tonight, especially as children of God. We're thankful for thy word that teaches us better how to walk in the light and appeal to our advocate, Jesus Christ. Even as we pray now, we pray through him, our mediator, that thou wouldst hear this prayer and answer us. Strengthen us, Father, and for those who are not Christians, may they humble themselves, believe, and from the heart obey the truth that they might be saved from past sins and know the forgiveness of sins in Christ. Help us, Father, to enjoy the blessings of life in Christ that we might walk in that light until heaven is our home. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.